So thank you, everybody, for showing up. I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is T. Miller. T is not mysterious. My short for Thomas, but my mother always called me T, so please call me T. Um, and I am delighted to uh, have uh, received the Selden Ring Award this year. It's an incredible honor, so uh, really uh, pleasing me personally. But I also think, as Geneva said, that it's great um, because it's going to bring some more attention and recognition both to uh, the model of collaborative journalism and nonprofit journalism, which is going to be a big deal for you guys as you enter the profession, uh, but it also brings attention to these folks um, who I call the hidden side of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. So I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about the story and how it kind of came to be, and then just kind of throw it up for questions. I don't want to talk a long time, but I'll just give you kind of a, a real brief um, history. Uh, I was originally signed to cover uh, contracting when the war in Iraq began, when I was working for the Los Angeles Times. And that was a kind of a basic follow the money beat, where you were going to rebuild Iraq and we were going to spend X, B, X billion dollars, uh, and how are we going to do that? So in the course of uh, just kind of doing that basic investigative reporting, who was receiving the money, what kind of things were being done, I kept running across these individual stories of individual guys who worked for these companies who had been killed or coming back uh, with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot like the soldiers were. And it began to occur to me that there was a whole separate story um, beyond the corporations that had to do with the people who were actually had been hired uh, to fight the war and to work on the war. Uh, so what I ended up Kind of, it was really greenfield territory. It was brand new territory at the time I begun, because nobody had a sense at all of how many civilian contractors or even were, or what was happening to them, or um, uh, what they were doing even on the battlefield. So there's a couple of key kind of numbers just to kind of keep in mind as I talk about this. One is that half of everyone in Iraq and Afghanistan right now deployed by the US is a contractor. And in fact, there are more civilian contractors, that is, people who are working under contract with some American agency in Afghanistan and Iraq than there are soldiers. So that's how large your problem this is. So fully half of the deployed forces in Iraq and Afghanistan are um, contractors of some kind or the other. They can be local Iraqi or Afghans who are hired to uh, build, uh, build a dam or dig a well. They can be uh, private security guys like the Z's and Blackwaters of the world who were very heavily armored and go around shooting people. Uh, or they can be just ordinary blue collar Americans who drive trucks and deliver the mail and things like that. 
And so uh, this story began with a guy called, who, who, who called himself Homeboy. And uh, he was an Iraqi who, when the troops came in in 2003, he was a Shiite, uh, really welcomed the invasion. He welcomed the overthrow of Saddam Hussein. Uh, he thought that the American invasion did represent uh, a new chapter for his country and was looking forward to democracy and freedom. And uh, I got a tip, I'm just covering sort of contracting, that this guy this, uh, um, had been working as a translator for the troops and his leg had been badly injured. And they took him to the hospital and they had to eventually amputate his leg. And right before they were gonna amputate his leg, he asked the nurse, give me a black magic marker. And on his leg he wrote, I dedicate this leg uh, to the Americans who brought freedom to my country. And then they you know, amputated his leg. And so when I heard about him, he had been abandoned and left to, uh, he had no leg, he had no prosthetic device, he had a two-year-old kid he couldn't carry around his house, he was being threatened because of his work with the Americans. And so it began as a feature story about this one individual who tried to kind of help out the American effort and had uh, been abandoned. And this is kind of a, an important lesson as to how investigative journalism can take just years to develop. Because if you go back and read that first story, which is not part of this series, it was written in 2004, I got it wrong. I wasn't concentrating on the right uh, angles uh, that eventually led to this whole idea of the disposable army. I was doing a feature story about one guy, and it just took kind of, I, but, but so in talking to him, there was, he had some emails from an American insurance company called AIG, who was supposed to be providing him prosthetic leg, but they couldn't, and they weren't going to do it, and they were funny, so I went back to Washington, and that's really the kickoff of this part, and that was in 2005, when that initial story ran, and these stories didn't run until last year, so that kind of gives you an idea of the arc of an investigative story it will often be very long, and you often don't know, when you're doing a, an early story, what the last story will lead to, so Homeboy eventually leads to this whole uh, five-part series that we did. Now, I began reporting it for uh, the LA Times when I was working here. I left the LA Times in August of 2008 and kept on working for it, uh, kept on working on the story while I was with ProPublica. And in total, if I'm really honest, the story probably would be took three years uh, in total. I would not full-time, but over the total course of many, many years uh, of, of, of doing. And one of the reasons is because it was so difficult just to kind of understand the idea that we had outsourced half the war, had I mean, taxpayers had actually paid for this very specialized kind of insurance to cover injuries for these guys. It was a really old system that had never been used before because we never had that many soldiers or contractors overseas. So it was a little tiny, obscure bureaucracy in the Department of Labor that was insuring Sri Lankan defense contractors for working for a Kuwaiti subcontractor, subcontracted to a Halliburton or a KBR. And it was these layers of bureaucracy and layers of, of, um, of a system which you had to get through to finally understand it. So we ended up doing uh, five stories, five basic stories, and I'll just kind of go through them. Or perhaps I won't go through them. Um, that we all put on one page here. that began with the basic, the basic story, which was the, the idea that we had, uh, there was this, this kind of obscure system designed to provide health care for civilian contractors who were, want, or who were wounded abroad. Now, so part of the story was finding the homeboys of the world, uh, Haider Kerala was his name, the examples to be able to tell the story. And that's kind of one of the dark arts of investigative journalism is finding how do you get and find and track down the anecdotes. But the other part is I wanted to tell it to make sure that I wasn't telling a story about one guy or one issue. And so the LA Times financed a two year long Freedom of Information Act lawsuit to get a list from the Department of Labor of every single person who had reported an injury. And that took forever. But once we had that data, you could combine you know, this, this, this many insurance companies and this many claims have been filed and then tell the story to certain individual people. And that's what this first story was about, is that just the basic idea that a lot of civilian contractors were being injured, and then they were having 
these huge fights with getting uh, health care for when they, when they return home. And in that kind of sense, it's a very typical health care story. You've got health insurance policy, and the insurance company doesn't want to pay for it. Except you have these guys had very unusual injuries, uh, like post-traumatic stress disorder, or, or missing three limbs, uh, because from a bomb blast, or having traumatic brain injury. So um, the one thing kind of led to another, and the second story was that the contractor workforce, those 250,000 or so people, although the most famous representatives are the guys with the guns, the black water disease of the world, most of them are actually uh, what they call third country nationals, which are um, essentially labor from third world countries like uh, the Philippines or Nepal, who are imported uh, by big companies like Halliburton and KBR to clean toilets and uh, do mess halls and um, do a lot of the scut work that used to be done by the military. So I started encountering these guys um, after there was a really horrific incident where there were 13 Nepalese who uh, one by one had their throats slit in the desert in western Iraq. And uh, I kind of traveled to Nepal to interview those families as part of that story. But in doing that story, I realized, well, these people too, why aren't they? Shouldn't they want to live their families and their, 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 their widows and their children? Are they going to get any of this health insurance? All of which I have to say is we all, we all pay for this. This is all paid for by taxpayers. So um, uh, that led to the second story, which is that the foreign workers are killed, and then once they're killed, uh, they, don't get, they don't get any benefits at all. I mean, in some cases, they're much worse off than the Americans, at least can fight for uh, these benefits. The foreign workers, I mean, a, a Nepalese who is illiterate and lives in a jungle, I mean, in a, in a small town with no communications and is working for a subcontractor to an Indian labor broker to a Kuwaiti firm that's working for uh, you know KBR, they're going to have no clue what to do or how to file a claim. So we had those stories also translated. I actually went to the Philippines for that story, uh, and we had it sort of translated into Filipino to make sure that Filipinos could be able to read that uh, about their rights. Um, and then the third story, and uh, one which I kind of end up thinking is the most sympathetic, was kind of the homeboy story. Uh, by this time, I had gotten to know uh, that Hyder had uh, applied for and come to the United States and received refugee status, and I'd come to know him quite well. So he's actually not a part of the story. So I felt like I had become very close to his family. So we went back to uh, Iraq and Jordan, and Afghanistan, and interviewed. Um, these Iraqis and Afghans, who in some way were to me the most sympathetic characters, because one can certainly argue that uh, you know, the Blackwater guy making $200,000 a year knew exactly what he was getting into and shouldn't he have saved up for his health care. These Iraqis and Afghans were making, um, at the most, $8,000 a year. And for an insurance company to deny a non-English speaking Afghan uh, you know, $3,000 a year payment is a strange to do all these. Why? What would the benefit would be in doing that? Like, why would you even worry about that? Uh, and also because these are locals who are, uh, their experiences in getting bruised and battered in the system are not, not knowing about it at all is part of the message that gets sent out to what is America really doing in Afghanistan and Iraq? I mean, <laughs> these guys get their legs blown off or, um, or they get killed. Uh, and they're abandoned, you know, it doesn't take too much to extend that metaphor to what's going to happen eventually long term if uh, America leaves Iraq and Afghanistan and what kind of situation people are going to be in. Uh, the fourth story I wanted to look at was the mental, uh, the post-traumatic stress disorder and the suicide issue. Um, you have, this is basically a system which is workers' compensation. So in other words, it's more or less designed for if you're working at Walmart and you slip and hurt your back, uh, you're supposed to go see your insurance provider, which is perfectly fine, of course. But these are people who have system uh, injuries which you, you wouldn't expect um, somebody in an you know, American workplace in general to suffer from, from post-traumatic stress disorder and have a traumatic brain injury or uh, be a vegetable. And that's what, so to give the insurance side of the story, uh, these were very difficult injuries. They were very different 
They were hard to document. Uh, they were very expensive, incredibly expensive injuries. Um, and so, uh, you know, they needed paperwork to process these claims, and it took a long time. Uh, and then I think as part of that, I'm not sure if I, we, had, we had a feature story that focused on one, uh, one contractor in particular who is um, going to cost uh, $250,000 a year for the rest of his life. He's a vegetable, essentially. Uh, and then we had a story overall about the government, how the government had let the system just mushroom and run wild and make no attempt really to rein in um, what the insurance companies were doing. So, uh, we, so that ended up being a way to tell this whole story about this hidden half of the war. And that there are now at least 2,000 dead contractors whom are never mentioned in any toll you will see in any war because they're not kept track. That number is necessarily low uh, because there are so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of and Nepalese and Filipinos and Sri Lankans who never appear in that number. Um, so really, you have about 4,500, close to 5,000 now actually, soldiers who've been killed, close to 2,000 contractors. So you have, really, the war's cost in, in basic human terms is, is about 25% more than it would have been if the government hadn't you know, outsourced uh, so much of uh, its labor over in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, after the series ran, uh, Congress held, we, we ran series both of the ABC News did a series on this, a piece on this. The Los Angeles Times ran several of these. The Washington Post had a piece on this. Um, the Daily Beast, which is Tina Brown's new uh, Daily News thing in New York, um, had a piece. Salon did a piece. And it was this, these, I think, this echo of, echoing of voices and stories across several different platforms that really made it a, you couldn't ignore it. It wasn't just like one newspaper or one place. It was, like it was appearing over and over again. Uh, and that's kind of one of the powers of the collaborative model is that it's harder to dismiss uh, if a lot of different news organizations are buying into or are believing there is merit in the story. It's not, it's, not, it's not just like one crazy reporter and one crazy newspaper uh, on a crusade tilting at windmills. You've managed to convince a number of platforms, a number of editors, this is an important real story, and that you've this is a real issue. And so I think that's one of the benefits of the, of the model. It's, it's slow, it takes a long time, uh, but it does have that building effect, which is, which is very impressive. And so after the stories ran, uh, Congress had a hearing. Sometime this uh, session, we hope, they're going to, um, uh, where they're going to write a uh, the Government Reform Oversight Committee will rewrite legislation, which will either A, force the Defense Department to kind of take over some of uh, the responsibility for these guys instead of just private insurance companies, uh, and will hopefully as well uh, increase penalties. The Department of Labor, which is the obscure bureaucracy who handles these claims, has pledged to step up their enforcement under um, a former Representative Tony Solis, who is now the Secretary of um, labor. Uh, and there are a number of uh, individual people who have gotten their claims paid off and their money paid. So I like to think the story did what uh, the Southern Ring Award is supposed to recognize uh, have an impact. Uh, and part of what ProPublica does is follow up its story to make sure that th that actually does occur. Um, so I don't want to take up a lot of additional time. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions and talk about uh, Themes. Thanks. Yeah. If the government were to start covering the insurance to the extent that it seems necessary, how, how would that affect the, the overall cost of the war? How much would we'll make it cheaper, presumably. Uh, it's not like the federal government doesn't insure all its employees now. I mean, the federal government has an enormous uh, workers' compensation system and an enormous budget to pay its uh, own employees' injuries. And if, an, if you're a State Department employee and you get blown up, you're covered by the government. This strange little program is the only, uh, is one of, at least one, of, I will say, is one of the only places where the government buys insurance. The government doesn't usually buy insurance. It doesn't have to. It's the government. It can pay cut checks for now until eternity. This little system evolved. Uh, because in the run-up to World War II, 
there was a, a horrific incident on Wake Island where a thousand um, construction workers for a, an Idaho firm, which later became one of the main reconstruction companies in Iraq, were kidnapped. Uh, kidnapped. They were seized by um, Japanese soldiers who made prisoners of war. And so they had, those widows, those families were left without any money. Uh, there wasn't any workers' compensation, so the unions at the time insisted the creation of this, and the government uh, hastily said, well, all right, we'll cut them some insurance, we'll buy some insurance. And that's literally the last time anybody touched or picked up this program. So that the, I mean, it, just, it simply makes uh, economic sense that the government should do with this what they do with everything else, which is they, they just have to pick up the cost. So, T, with all these, uh with all this, these web, uh, this web of contractors, right? Because we have everything from, as you said, black water disease to, uh, uh, to probably dozens of others. Right? There is no, there isn't even a uniform system in terms of just in terms of talking about uh, insurance, right? right. You're looking at AIG, and that was for what contractor? Well, as it turns out, uh, no. Uh, so yes, there's multiple insurance companies, but AIG very uh, deliberately, uh, Hank Greenberg, the former CEO, um, served on a council of businessmen who advised the Department of Defense. And as the Department of Defense began sending, this is, this is a legal requirement. You have to buy this insurance to be able to go overseas. So as they began going overseas, nobody was selling it. So Greenberg, who was the head of AIG at the time, made the very smart, savvy business of we're going to sell all this stuff. So he, he ends up, yeah, right. He ends up selling 85% of all the policies. Now, what's great about these policies, they're not, they're not large overall of AIG's business, um, but it's government money, so you're going to get paid. And two, if you are injured, another obscure thing about this is if you're actually injured by a um, attack by the enemy, the government will reimburse you in full for the cost of that claim and give you 15% additional profit. So one of the times I knew it was a story was when I was at an insurance industry conference and an insurance guy who was sitting next to me didn't know I was not an insurance guy was hearing this presentation. He turns around and says to me, God, this is the greatest thing ever. It's a guaranteed 15% claim. I can't lose on it. I was like, oh, okay, all right. Uh, it's like a profit center. Yeah, there's no risk for them. Uh, so um, these policies pay off. Like the average workers' comp policy in the U.S., uh, you don't make any money at all. It's all of your investments. You basically break even. You take in as much premium as you pay out claims. These things, you make at least 50% uh, more in premiums than you pay out. So, and then you also get investment income on top of that. So these are incredibly profitable policies for the insurance companies, or have been. Uh, and so, and the other answer to your question is, if you ask the government today how many contractors are deployed in the battlefield, they still can't tell you. There's a, there's a, a number of problems with uh, the database they have to track of that. So, I mean, this is, this is early on, you could understand why they would know that. It was a war zone, but it's been eight years. And to still not have any clue how many people you have actually deployed there working for you is, I think, a little surprising. Yeah? So what has motivated so many You make great money uh, if you're an American. Well, actually, you make great. I mean, we, I say eight thousand dollars a year seems like a little bit of money, but if you're an Iraqi or an Afghan, that's a lot of money. I mean, that's more than double the um, average per capita income of an of triple of an Afghan. Um, so, uh, money is certainly a motive. But I have to say, one of the things I liked about this story, I loved about the story, is that contractors are not necessarily sympathetic people, right? I mean, they're generally portrayed, I mean, have been portrayed as being you know, the guys with guns who run around and shoot innocent civilians. Um, I kind of like that. It makes them hard. You can't just kind of say, uh, you know, they're not, you just can't pour them out and say they're sympathetic characters. Uh, but the question always was, do you put a price on your compassion? Do you really, uh, just because that guy made $200,000, do you really want to leave him with legs and arms for his life? Is that, you know, th does his uh, motivations for going over for money negate our ability to insist at least upon the basic delivery of health services to this guy. So I, but I have to say that in talking to these guys, to finish off, uh, yes, money was always a factor. You made a lot of money. But a lot of these guys are former military. They tend to be older than soldiers. 
And a lot of them really believed in what they were doing. They believed they were making, uh, helping out the U.S. forces. Um, a lot of these blue collar guys, like you know Wade Dill, if you want to live out the American dream and you're living in a uh, in Oklahoma or rural Oregon, uh, your options for making a decent middle class salary are pretty low. So. One of the things I say is that a lot of these people, to live the American dream, they had to go to Iraq and work. <coughs> and they had to, they want to put braces on their, on their kids' teeth. If they wanted to uh, you know, buy their house, pay off their mortgage, uh, he wanted to save up money for uh, his daughter's college education. Uh, this is how they did it. You know, you'd go over to Iraq for one or two years, you'd make $100,000 a year, uh, which is great money if you're a truck driver. And you'd come back, and you would be able to finally be free and clear of that credit card debt that's been hanging over your head for 20 years. So yeah, they did it for the money. But there were good reasons to do that. Yeah. So you, just from your reporting, it's sort of tangential to the story that you've done. But do you think that the, the system of private contractors is here to stay for future engagements and will be even, even bigger? Um, yeah. That it's so expensive and, you know. oh, yeah, I like to call the diplomatic industrial complex uh, has developed, which is essentially parallel to the military industrial complex, which is the very well established, well known contracting out uh, for like weapons and things like that. Uh, now has developed an enormous industry of uh, service providers of things like you know cleaning toilets and making lunch. And so we've hired, one of the things I, uh, I, I've often said is that um, we've hired the poorest people in the world to do the dirtiest jobs in the most dangerous places on Earth. Uh, and that's essentially why we've got almost 2,000 dead contractors. I don't think that there's, there's no chance that's going away. It's very, uh, saves a lot of money. Right. The military is, uh, I mean, this isn't, they won't immediately say this, but if you press them for any time, they will acknowledge they cannot, they cannot possibly, and the State Department and USAID and no one else can possibly do their jobs without contractors anymore. Uh, in terms of cost savings, there have been studies done, and there's no question that on a short-term basis, when you have to suddenly hire a million people and you're going to fire a million people, yes, because you're not having to pay long-term benefits and things like that. Uh, that saves money. But if you look beyond the short-term, there's really no evidence at all that um, long-term contracting out private services saves money. I mean, for eight, nobody, I, uh, I don't know if nobody, but uh, I don't think anybody expected, at least, that we were going to be in Afghanistan for eight years. You know, if you could go back in time and say, we now have a 10-year nation-building project, would you rather contract that out or kind of develop a, you know, a robust USAID staff? I think most government people, not all maybe, but I think most people say, well, we prefer to have, a, you know, have an in-house staff to be able to do this. But uh, here we are eight years later, and has it saved a lot of money to do this? Um, I don't. I think I have yet to see any kind of really definitive study which says yes. Yeah, just a, a, a comment a question. On, on this issue of contracting, the US military used to have books and construction crews mm -hmm. that would treat part of draft. Right. right. I mean, I, it's, that's the way you could double these numbers. Right. Um, and the, the costs are salary or benefits.
Yeah, each, each collaboration that we've done um, has been different. I'll just talk in general, not about the specific date. Each one has been different. So um, I've now published stories in uh, LA Times, the Washington Post, the New York Times, ABC News, Newsweek, NPR, Salon, uh, Daily Beast, and a couple of other places. Um, and each collaboration ends up being very different and, and interesting. Uh, they all, sometimes you come in with a pitch. So for this story, for instance, which I had done most for the LA Times, uh, well, half of it, which I had done for the LA Times, they were the natural partner because I had done so much of the work for them, for them you know, when, I, when I was working there. So that, they, were, they were the natural kind of first partner we would turn to, and they knew the story. Um, so that was kind of unusual. Um, the Washington Post, uh, John Palmfrey was the then Outlook uh, editor, who's now in their China correspondent, an old foreign correspondent. He was very interested in the topic, so he actually kind of commissioned a piece. And so I did a piece for him. Uh, with ABC News, we kinda, I had kind of a half-formed piece, and I said, would you guys be interested in, in going, sort of doing additional work on this? And they said, yeah, that's great. So they went out and they did their own reporting, and I would say, I was kind of like a skeleton, and they kind of added on to it and added flesh and bones to actually go out and interview people in the field. And you know, Brian Ross went out there, and he was talking and doing a lot of the interviews. Could you decide on NBC News just to tap yeah. into this same thing? Because I've been working on it too. Because you wanted to kind of broaden to broadcast, or did you decide there was a certain story that lent itself to more? Of that? I think the ABC News thing, because what uh, I think the ABC News thing happened because we do go out and talk to partners and say. Um, Here's our list of stories that we're doing right now. Or do any of these interest you? And it just so happened that one of the characters, I mean, this was a topic which was of interest to Brian Ross and Oni Patel, his producer. But it just so happened that one of the characters in the story was someone they had previously they knew, they had previously interviewed, who had been a truck driver, who had been a particularly horrific uh, convoy. He had a great uh, video of this hor horrific convoy attack. So because they're familiar with that guy and because they're interested in the topic, they kind of were the ones who jumped uh, at doing the story. Um, and those, those kind of moments of serendipity are often ultimately what, what these partnerships turn on. Uh, some guy has an interesting topic, and so he's interested, and he wants to do it. Or uh, Paul Steiger knows somebody else. And I, with the Daily Beast, for instance, Paul Steiger um, knew uh, one of the editors over there and just mentioned to him in a lunch and said, yeah, I would love to run a piece uh, about this. Uh, and then sometimes it's more, you just kind of come in and knock on the door and give people a list, like with NPR, and they said, oh, this looks really interesting. Yeah, we'd like to do the story. So you know, with each collaboration, with each partnership, they're, very, they're not systematic at all. They're very much a work in progress. And that's why sometimes um, the, the, the frustrating part of the partnerships is it can be, they can move very slowly. Like you can get nothing for a while, like they won't be interested. So. No, just don't, uh, don't be any story. So, well, did you like have a list of stories that you were out peddling simultaneously in various places? I mean, just sort of the equivalent of a slug list. Yes, yeah, slug list, right? You know. Um, yes, basically. I had a, We have we have a, like a. I, I'm not exactly sure because I, I don't have a lot of uh, visibility of exactly how it is that our editors do this, but when they, other editors at top papers, I think there's a kind of cone of silence that comes down, and then they show our you know, list of working stories, and are there any that are interested in And then it's obviously, there's a moment, there's a moment there where, okay, so T. Miller's working on, he has this great document, well, why would the New York Times turn around and say, we'll go get it ourselves now that we know about it? So far, that's never happened. I mean, there's a certain degree of, of, of trust, which is built into this, where you just kind of have to assume there's some honor among thieves and that um, you know we're all going to play uh, adult here and wow okay that's a good story and I could cut the legs out from under you and go get that same interview or document myself but why because you're just going to make ProPublica angry and, and uh, whatever so let's go ahead and do the partnership Um, 
I think that, uh, well, both specifically on the actual very specific topic of this Defense Base Act insurance system, which is what this is called, called Defense Base Act insurance, I, I don't think uh, ever a Bush or Obama have ever mentioned it. Both of them, uh, much, actually, let me take it back. Uh, so, yes, I don't think either of them have mentioned the Defense Base Act system in particular. <coughs> However, the Obama administration and Secretary Clinton uh, and Ambassador Holbrook have made it a point of focus to reduce the ranks of contractors because they feel it has been uh, an enormous waste of money and an, an, an enormous um, diffusion of control over American interests abroad. And I think that this, this series, which is kind of telling the story of a hidden army and what the effects of that army were uh, through a kind of a health lens, uh, was part of the overall it was a part of the overall picture that I had developed as a covering the money or following the money thing, which is is this a useful and smart way to go about conducting American foreign policy? I mean, I, I like to believe that. Um, and in terms of why I haven't gotten a lot of attention, because it's, it's freaking hard. Um, it's really this is like when I said it's, there was no signposts. I like to say that there's no veterans groups which can say. Um, these guys are suffering from TBI. Uh, there's no lobby for contractors, really, for the workers. There's no lobby for the workers, uh, the workforce. And I like to conceptually differentiate the corporations from the people who work for them. There's no unions, there's no workers, there's no advocates for these guys. So it literally was a process of going one by one. And, um, you know, I traveled to Jordan, Iraq, the Philippines, Nepal. Uh, we sent other reporters to Peru, to South Africa. I went to, I think, 15 or 20 different states to actually interview these individual guys and find them one by one. Uh, it, and there was a two-year-long lawsuit. I mean, it was a very difficult story to do. So if today the Washington Post wanted to not collaborate, wanted to do this as a fresh new story, it's an enormous investment of time and effort to just kind of get into the ground level. You mentioned um, before about the possible, the, the sense that, that you know, if, if people are, you know, from other countries are going back home after not getting properly compensated, that this could, you know, certainly on an individual level, maybe on a community level, maybe even on a national level, begin to turn people against more against the U.S. And I remember being in Bulgaria a few years ago when. Um, uh, a mercenary, who we call a mercenary, who was basically doing a lot of the same work as the soldiers for a fraction of the cost. Mm -hmm. Apparently putting greater, uh, more in harm's way in this case. And, you know, Bulgaria, which is a very pro-U.S. country, it became a real, this guy was sending money back to his grandparents, and his grandparents were hurting after the fall of communism, there was no pension anymore, and so on. So it became this sort of national, you know, kind of soul-searching, um, and I wonder how much you've seen of that. I mean, I don't know if you've actually had a chance to do that sort of reporting, but I've, 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 no, I, I've, I've, I've thought a lot about that because I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gurkhas in the British Empire. And the, the Brits, uh, the Gurkhas are a very ill-defined uh, uh, people from Nepal and India who uh, were the British during the World War II would essentially employ, not as contractors, but they were sort of like, um, you know, a, a, a mercenary force. And they were paid for by the British Army. And there have been decades of litigation in the UK and in Nepal and India about how to compensate these guys. And there are terrific pictures of these Nepalese soldiers who uh, <coughs> were saving British soldiers' lives and British diplomats' lives. Um, and now we're, you know, living with, uh, in, in a mud hut in the middle of nowhere. That is. Clearly, I mean, I, I would predict that that's going to happen here. That you're going to have, uh, I mean, all these Iraqis, these guys all have uh, medals of honor or heroism. And like, you know, these guys saved Americans' lives. They were dragging American soldiers out of burning Humvees and things like that. And now you're just going to tell them because you don't have a document from the Iraqi police department that says, uh, yeah, your leg was blowing off that day, you're going to have to hobble around on a stick the rest of your life. There's no way that's not going to have uh, a reverberation throughout society because yes, it's going to it's going to burden those local health systems. It's going to be a very visible reminder of what the price of um, your work has been, and I just think that it's going to 
it's something that's gonna be years in the making. And when you consider that a lot of these injuries are not gonna, especially psychological injuries, or like toxic exposure type injuries is gonna go on for, I mean, you're seeing it right now in America, you're seeing a lot of soldiers bringing up toxic exposure issues. Uh, this is a worldwide, we, we hire people from all over the world. There's more, there's more countries hired, um, people from our countries, I mean, the coalition of the willing and far fewer people were actually participating than there are contractors. There's many more nations representing the contracting force than representing the coalition of the willing force. So it is a worldwide, global thing, uh, and you will see it reverberate for a long time, I believe. <coughs> my understanding, uh, I might be wrong, my understanding was that the uh, introduction of so many contractors into the armed forces really uh, began to peak with Clinton and Boswell. And I might be wrong, but that's what I understand. Uh, and, my, my, and I don't know how much of this you looked into, but I'm curious if you know or if you can speculate as to what drives this, because um, there's, I mean, I guess there's three possible answers. One is that it's just pure economic calculation. The people just say, well, it's just cheaper. Mm -hmm. uh, even though apparently you are probably not the only one who knows that there isn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so at some point you figure that figure that out. Is, is it the political issue, which is that it just keeps uh, a reduction of forces. You just don't have to even begin to deal with the idea of a possible draft, et cetera. And these folks are all invisible uh, and disposable. Uh, or is it uh, even something more sinister, you know, is it a question of collusion and profiteering where the folks sit down and say, hey, you know, we got a place here, we can really make some money off of this, and it looks cheaper. Right. Uh, uh, how about all three? <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think there's some element of all three, and, and I've had different little, I do believe there is a, there's certainly a belief amongst um, some government contracting specialists that it is cheaper to hire contractors. Number two, it is a wonderful way to diffuse blame. It wasn't my fault that all those innocent Iraqi civilians got killed. It was a stupid contractor who did it. So it's a, it's a very convenient way. Or the Afghan police force um, uh, doesn't work because we contracted out to this company and uh, you know they, they messed it up. Well, really, where were you? You were the government, so ultimately your responsibility. Uh, I know that there is an issue, at least it's something in the back of the mind, that it is a way to avoid liability, or sort of like to have too big of an American footprint. And I say that only because I was at a luncheon once when I was in the bureau chief in Colombia. We've also contracted out a lot of work in Colombia with then Ambassador Ann Patterson, who's now the ambassador of Pakistan. And uh, we asked the question, well, why have you hired so many contractors? Does it kind of hide how many Americans are down here? And her assistant goes, oh, yeah. She goes, no, 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 no. It's <laughs> <laughs> great, it great moments. You're like, ah, OK. Um, somebody's thinking about that. And then I do believe there's a, there's a, there's a, a lobbying. You are, you are creating an industry now. I mean, uh, AIG yeah. well, AIG is going to be before. But I mean, like, take Blackwater, Z, which did not exist as a company in 2001. And now, well, they're very wounded, but became this enormous contracting enterprise. What are you going to do with all these private security contractors that you're now creating and hired? They've got to find work somewhere. I mean, you're not going to fire them all. They're now a large business, so they're going to be lobbying and do things like, hey, in Haiti, uh, you're going to need protection for all the diplomats in Haiti. And we can, oh, by the way, we can train them. We can train the Haitian police force. So here's our next uh, business development opportunity. Sudan, uh, boy, it's still messed up in Sudan. If you send in a uh, private uh, security contractors, you know we can protect these guys and we can help them out. These aren't really uh, hypothetical examples of what's happening right now. So you are creating an industry just as the industrial, just the military industrial complex creates its own industry and its own sort of momentum. Uh, you were doing that by contracting out a lot of the services that used to be done by aid workers or just soldiers or diplomats. When you call the Department of State or the Pentagon and say, I'm P. Miller from ProPublica instead of I'm P. Miller from the OA Dumps, what, is, there, is there a difference? You know, if it's now, Washington's a different place. And Washington's a very media-sensitive uh, place. So 
and within a matter of months, that was no longer an issue. Um, if, however, our reporters call to uh, the LA City Council, let's say, they may not know what ProPublica is. So, but if you're working with your partner, <laughs> if you have a partner going in, then you say, uh, I'm with ProPublica, I'm working with the LA Times on a story. So then you get the phone calls back. If you're kind of freelancing, you're sort of trying to develop the story idea, uh, I don't run into this as much because I work in Washington because I'm, I'm a known name and person quantity in Washington. I've been there for a while. Uh, but yeah, certainly going outside, uh, it's more difficult uh, because they don't know what ProPublica is yet, and I don't think they ever will. And ProPublica is never going to be a big enough entity to have that kind of nationwide impact. But that's, again, where the partner or the platform come in handy because they can be very useful because they have the brand re or recognition. Yeah, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the, the model. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, uh, relies on a uh, philanthropic model. Um, the uh, Center for Investigative Reporting in California, one of the two guns in the relies on a philanthropic model. Uh, you know, we're raising $7 million from different California foundations. You guys have the Family Family and others. And, you know, and inherently, it's a fragile model. Um, one would like to think that um, the intelligentsia of the society would recognize that this is, a, this is a cornerstone of democracy. At the same time, who's to say that after a few years, a foundation, officers at a foundation or a family, you know, he said, ah, you know, we're going to put our money somewhere else. And how fragile do you think this model is, or do you think it's, it's going to grow? Uh, I think that's a great question. And one of the things I like to say is that. Um, it pains me that I work for ProPublica to some degree because ProPublica is a solution, it's a, a piece of the solution, but it's never going to replace the work that's done every day or has been done every day in metro newsrooms and broadcast stations throughout the country. I mean, our budget is $10 million a year. LA Times' newsroom budget back in the day was $100 million a year that's for one city. So um, ProPublica or in California Watch and the Center for Investigative Reporting and the Center for Public Integrity combined are not going to do a tenth of what the Daily Newsroom of America do every day right now under increasing threat. Um, and so I, I don't see the nonprofit news model as ever going to replace the for profit news industry. It's just not going to. Um, it's never you're not getting you're never getting enough donors. They're not going to have enough sustained donor interest to, to do that. I don't think. Um, and so I think uh, no one should be complacent that it's oh, okay now we've got all these nonprofit news models out there. It's all great. Uh, you know, together combined we can produce 10 percent of, of what uh, two percent of what the nation's uh, reporters uh, do in the papers today. Um, so the answer to your question is that, uh, in, ter and in terms of uh, funding models, yes, there is a built-in in fragility. I don't know that, that uh, anybody has a solution, and I don't know that um, the commercial models have proven any more robust, frankly, right now. Um, but what I do, I'm absolutely certain of, is that the nonprofit newspaper model or news organization model is no replacement for the thriving free press as we have known it. Uh, until today. Yeah, sort of on the same same point. I mean, what's interesting about this project in some ways captures this sort of transitional moment because you were in this transition from having started the project in a regular commercial news organization mm -hmm. and then the transition to sort of this nonprofit phase and then this collaborative. It seems that when you think about the collaborations the way you're describing your interactions with various editors, I mean, to a certain extent, they were profiting from some cost that had been put in early in the project. Mm -hmm. and the way, when you were talking about how, I mean, I can imagine somebody looking at this when G2 concluded a two year employee thing, they discussed with five years old, we're never going to catch up with them. So, yeah. Right. It's way easier to take a story than to try and get into this at this point. Um, I'm curious whether, in terms of what you're doing now in the next iteration, mm -hmm. uh, or what ProPublica is doing, is how is there a mechanism to replicate that some costs, but by the time you go out to the collaboration, I mean, this would have been different if you had been out peddling something.
something that was absolutely in the first stages, for example, where you're saying uh, this this could be, you know, when you have that sense of a big booming mm -hmm. object Sorry. out yeah. there, but you don't. Well, that's, what, that's, that's a great question. I was talking with Geneva about that just before we came down here. The first year of ProPublica really was about knocking down doors and who are you and um, having battles over kind of just getting into uh, print or getting on the broadcast. This year, uh, the last six months, it's still not easy, but it's much more a sense of we're going to go into this together. So, for instance, the story I did is that I had the the story that was on the cover of Newsweek about two weeks ago on the Afghan police department. The way that story came about is um, Newsweek actually had gotten a tip that involved a contracting company that I'd written out for. They knew who I was, so they called me in, and myself and the Newsweek said, all right, let's go down and explore this together, and I'll do some of this, and Mark Hosenball, who was the other reporter on it, was an intelligence reporter. And by the end, uh, Newsweek had, had, had sent their correspondence out to Marja in Afghanistan and to Kabul. Um, they had other guys uh, who were working in New York, um, and ProPublica's contribution was once among amongst many. And so that was a very much, uh, yeah, did we save them money? Yeah, sir, because I was working on Pro, ProPublica's dime. Uh, but that was very much kind of a step-by-step. -step. We're working uh, with uh, NPR on a collaboration now that I hope will be the same way, that you know we're kind of going in together and developing the story, and, and as in investigative stories, maybe not all, maybe it won't turn out the way we think it will, but uh, we're going in together. And I find that, a bit, that to me is going to be the, the more fruitful long-term partnership, rather than kind of ProPublica being a freelancer who gives away um, stories for free, we become a collaborative partnership that uh, is, has the ability to reverberate in, by having a collaboration louder than any kind of single publication would be able to have. Any other student questions? You all are doing some good investigative reporting. I must say, we've broken some good stories at uh, me and Tommy. It's must be ringing some bells for you. Anybody want some tips from a long time pro? We can't share them. We can't the share them. <laughs> 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 Very well, tone of silence. Tone of silence. Tone of silence. <laughs> Well, yeah, go ahead. Just to, uh, sorry, sort of following up for So, uh, the assignment of prizes, which is, uh, gets the juices flowing for editors, uh, uh, you're eligible for the Pulitzer Prize, and ProPublica is, is eligible for all the major broadcast prizes, I take it? Uh, yes, I think so. Um, I don't really know how the prize committees have. Uh, I don't know if they consider this like an LA Times entry or would they consider this an ABC? Well, there's an online specific category, but yeah. I don't really know how individual uh, prizes make decisions about Is ProPublica a web uh, entry? Is it an online entry? Is it a um, print entry? Is it a. Yeah, is it a contract? Yeah, is it a contract? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Um, so uh, that's a, let's say, a t I think it's interesting. It's going to be an interesting challenge to go forward. Has there been any discussion of how the prizes should be shared? Or have there been that many prizes for ProPublica? Um, no, ProPublica this year has won a number of uh, prizes. Um, and I don't recall internally any <coughs> discussion about that. But that may have occurred. I don't know. Yeah, right. yeah. Of all the collaborators. Yeah, I mean, certainly, like, um, in this particular series, I believe, uh, du uh, the Los Angeles Times, for instance, uh, uh, Doug Smith, uh, who many of you may know, um, was uh, a big help in analyzing some of the data. So um, uh, I believe he was, uh, when the press was issued, his contributions were mentioned. Um, I think we just entered these stories, just the stories that I had written. Think for this one. For other ones, though, for instance, um, we were finalists for the Danny Pearl Award, um, and our uh, one of our fellow uh, freelancer who helped work for us was part of that, as was the ABC team. So I think it depends on I don't know the contract entry and I mean the contest entry and how it's done and what they put on that. Well, uh, TA has been very generous about doing his giving time to. 
Alan Milstead's investigative reporting class and he'll be joining Bryce's Media and Society uh, seminar on this afternoon and um, will be here, of course, tomorrow. And all of us appreciate the importance of investigative reporting, particularly in this budget challenge time. And you've shown us a terrific example, and I'm so glad we can honor you with the Selman Ring Award. Thanks so much. Thank you.